All right, thanks a lot, everybody. So we are addressing the topic of consciousness, and with us, to guide us through this journey, we have Dr. Martin Irvine, who is with CCT. He's an expert in semiotics and uh, symbolic cognition, among many other things. This is one of his recent avenues. We have uh, Professor Dr. Francisca Cho, who is who does uh, Buddhist studies and cultural phenomenon, as well as looking at Buddhism in science. So, and we also have Shadi El Dwani, who's a PhD candidate in the interdisciplinary neuroscience program here. So, this is an interesting time, right, to deal with consciousness because questions that were once the sole purview of philosophers and religious scholars are now something that science is actively probing, right? We're doing this with experimental, experimental methods. So we're seeing all these disciplines converge around this topic of consciousness with the attempt to unravel. Where does it emerge? How does it work? Could we recreate it? And that is really what we want to focus on here tonight. We're going to lay some groundwork, get some definitions from our panelists of what some of the prevailing theories are of what consciousness means in their work and where it emerges. But we really want to look at what are the implications of this work for building technologies using the knowledge we gain about unraveling this black box, the ultimate black box that is our own minds. So without further ado, I will start with Dr. Irvine. And I would like to. <laughs> I'm startled into consciousness. <laughs> <laughs> so I would, I would like to get, in your perspective, when you hear consciousness, when you think about this topic, what does that elicit for you? What are the theories that most guide your work and your focus? Well, to be quite honest, I, uh, I kind of bracket off consciousness as uh, uh, taking a cue from David Chalmers, who coined the term the hard problem of consciousness, which seems to me to be fundamentally uh, unobservable, or uh, the processes are, are not still you know, in, our, in our purview. Uh, the classic problem of, do you know this term, the hard problem of consciousness, which is, do we have a way to explain how what we experience as human consciousness, of, of mind, of awareness, of perception, all of our higher cognitive abilities, including self-consciousness and self-awareness, um, how do we explain that uh, and square it with a, uh, uh, a physical definition of the universe? That is, how does, how, how does the phenomenal mind as we experience, or anything that we want to call you know, human consciousness, or cognition as a kind of subcategory, uh, what is the explanation for this phenomenon emerging out of uh, physical matter, you know, out of the physical stuff of the universe? Um, and I don't really see many ways of accounting for that with the tools that we have available. I'm more interested in other kinds of cognitive things that we're uh, starting to get a little more uh, understanding of. And I was talking with colleagues about you know, language, and, and there's research going on correlating what's going on in uh, neurocognitive studies. And, what a lot of linguists are working on. And there's this emergence, you know, kind of convergence in a lot of work in cognitive sciences around language, right? And I think we're making some incredible, you know, breakthroughs and in understanding, at least understanding a little bit more of that. But when we get into trying to define, um, like one of the paradoxes, you know, fundamentally, is that anybody who, who's really truthful with themselves about the field, say in artificial intelligence, is that there's, so much fundamental, fundamentally that we don't understand about intelligence, right? I mean, basic human cognitive capabilities and, and, and coming up with workable definitions even for human intelligence, that to say that we're able to model things and create artificial intelligence, right, just seems to me a preposterous, you know, extrapolation. So I, I would just say that consciousness is something that we should look at how to approach but for me, fundamentally, there are certain things that, uh, to be honest scientifically, you know, we also need to be willing to bracket and say there's some things that are f were, were fundamentally unobservable or, or, or we, we don't have the ability to get to, but that shouldn't block or obscure the things that we can, right, the things that we can investigate. So I think that can tie into work you're doing, Shadi. 
what are some of the avenues, some of the things that were previously bracketed off that we're starting to be able to pry open with experimental observational method? Yeah, so just to address your question you know, that you first opened up the floor with, which is, what is consciousness? Consciousness, that's kind of actually really easy if you think about it. It's the feeling of awareness. It's uh, the angst of post-industrial man under you know, late capitalism. It's, um, <laughs> it's you know, when you wake up in the morning and you smell your roommate making coffee. It's you know, that giddiness that you feel when you, you know, fall in love for the first time. Um, consciousness, you know, from an not an operational point of view, but from a very general point of view, it's very easy to say what it is. Um, but in the business of cognitive science, where we are very interested in how people process their environment and what sorts of mechanisms underlie the behavior that we see, all the way from explicit uh, sorts of things such as you know, uh, seeing somebody perform something and that explicitly informs your opinions or your actions, all the way down to the implicit things, the sort of things that subliminally prime you to do the things that you do, such as um, you know, you wake up in the morning, you turn on the TV, and you know you hear nothing but bad news, and that you know informs the rest of your day. You just end up going, you know, through the rest of the day in, in a bad mood. It's like a, I guess a simple example, but um, in the field of so I study uh, language. Um, I'm really interested in how uh, the structure of the language informs what we know about cognition, um, and how much of cognition is actually just a consequence of of how language is organized in the brain. So consciousness, we can sort of, uh, what, we, what we end up doing is tabling what uh, Dr. Irvine referred to as the hard problem of consciousness or the qualia problem of consciousness. We table that and say, you know, we're not really interested in the subjective experiences of, of consciousness for the, for the most part. There are other fields which I can go into which are interested in this question, which are very interesting from a medical point of view, uh, particularly aphasic, aphasics and uh, uh, also like uh, people who are in traumatic experiences where um, they're unable to have any motor output, but you still want to know whether they're conscious or not. Um, so what we end up doing is tabling the question of qualia and asking more fundamental questions about uh, what, is, what is memory? What are the subcomponents of memory? How does memory interact with attention? Is attention a singular unitary phenomenon? Is, or is it composed of many different types of attentional mechanisms? Um, what are the subcomponents of language and does the brain also have representations for each of these subcomponents, or does the brain do something completely different? Um, so from a cognitive science perspective, you can do a lot of fruitful research in all sorts of things, uh, from language to emotional processing um, uh, to uh, uh, like things like game theory, which are important in, in neuroeconomics, um, just by looking at the fundamental components that are an indispensable part of consciousness, such as the explicit memory of an, of an episodic event, or um, uh, the, the ability to divide your attention to you know, multiple things at the same time. So all these things are related to consciousness, but um, we can chop it up in such a way that we can investigate one of these things at, 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 at a time. But the big question is, you know, we do want to know what it is you know, for something to have um, a unified uh, uh, conscious experience. What does it mean to put all of these processes together? Does that give us what we would expect um, from, from a subjective point of view? If that makes sense. Yeah. And it's, it's something that I think we've been doing for a long time, right? Is thinking about this idea of what does it mean to be conscious? Where does this reside? And so I, I would like to get your historical perspective and also the perspective of someone who's specializing in Buddhist studies, right? Because we see in the West there's this dualism going on between the soul and you know the matter that you that your body inhabits. So kind of walk us through a little bit where we've been historically in answering these questions. And if you'd like, tack on at the end if it seems like we're actually getting somewhere or we're still diving in and finding more and more questions as we go. Okay. That's, uh... <laughs> you can, you can let's, let's start by getting the historical perspective, and maybe we'll all attack that. Right. We'll right. do the seminar and that whole thing, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm um, coming at this uh, from the perspective of Buddhist thinking about the mind uh, and body, which um, they do talk about and think about. You know, they define the person as a complex of mental uh, and physical processes. Um, 
and in my own work across Buddhist uh, thought and science, modern science, I'm interested in how uh, these two cultural um, paradigms uh, can have a conversation with each other. So it seems to me that in current cognitive science and neuroscience and philosophy today in our culture, uh, the Cartesian model still pretty much dominates, even if you're not a dualist. And of course, many scientists and philosophers are not dualists. They're monists. But um, Cartesianism still dominates uh, to the degree that uh, we think of words like consciousness and uh, body, mind and body, as referring to substances with essences. And this goes back to a very Aristotelian metaphysics. So when we ask what is consciousness, we're assuming that the word consciousness refers to something that exists. Uh, it is a substance, although it might be a substance without extension in space, as Descartes um, defined the mind. Uh, and matter is a different kind of substance with different properties, which includes extension uh, in space, which created the problem of how two such different opposing substances could actually coexist, and that's the classic mind-body problem. Um, it's interesting how, in the case of Buddhist thinking about the mind-body complex, it's completely outside of both the Cartesian um, paradigm and its basis in Aristotelian substance essence thinking. So. Um, In what way? Could you elaborate on yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. Um, so mind and body um, do not refer to things or substances. They refer to certain qualities of experience. So one uh, notable aspect of Buddhist thought, which a lot of scientists think makes Buddhism compatible with science, is that it rejects the concept of a soul. It rejects the concept of this kind of uh, essence that is the true uh, heart nature of the person. Uh, it's immaterial. It's immortal, not subject to physical decay. Um, what a lot of religions and philosophies have identified as kind of the, the true self, and we can just call it the soul. Now, Buddhism expressly ref, uh, rejects that idea, which gets you know, Western rationalists excited because they think, ah, oh, here's, here's a religion that doesn't you know, talk about hocus pocus things. Um, and uh, Buddha, Buddhism recognizes that the body and physical processes are the basis of the arising of mind. And that sounds very much um, in agreement with scientific thought as well. Consciousness arises from uh, the body. Does that resonate with uh, the view of uh, embodied cognition and, and the recent, that kind of work in, in cognitive science? Uh, are you talking about Francisco Varela's well, Varela, notion? Andy Clark, I mean, you know, Hutchins, I mean, all the people who are working on, on uh, the notion of consciousness not being a brain bound thing, but that takes in, into account the whole body, the whole nervous system, of the body's interaction with an environment, uh, that what we consider cognition and consciousness isn't something located in the brain, mm -hmm. locked in the brain. Right, right, right. right. Uh, kind of extended mind concept, yeah. right, interaction yeah. with environment. But also okay. that, that, you know, the, the brain is, is embodied and, and the mind yes. is embodied. Yes. So what, whatever it is that we consider mind to be or brain to be, uh, you mentioned the black box concept that you know that um, it, it's it's in limiting and, and contradictory to say that consciousness can be located um, solely as a as a brain bound activity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, there is I think uh, a lot of resonance and conversation uh, across Buddhist thought and cognitive science. Uh, around that ba yeah, basically uh, all around those issues and. Um, going back to um, the Buddhist perspective, uh, what, what gives rise to that on the Buddhist side is just as um, consciousness and um, mind are not thought to be um, 
again, a substance, however you might define it or characterize it. Neither is matter or the body thought of as a substance or a thing. All right, so it, it, it goes both ways. So it, it's a mistake, as some modern scientists have done, to identify Buddhism with this kind of monist view that says matter is the ultimate uh, stuff of the universe. Matter is what really exists, and everything else, including mind and consciousness, arises from it. Instead, uh, it comes out, uh, it, it exits this Aristotelian viewpoint altogether uh, to talk about the experience or phenomenon of subjectivity uh, hand in hand with the experience of um, uh, the physical universe. Seeing both as uh, equally real or unreal, as the case may be, uh, because they're understood as processes, not things, all right? So mind or consciousness is the uh, experience of awareness that's aware of sensations uh, created by the body, which leads to mental classifications uh, as well as emotional responses. You know, I like it, I don't like it, whatever the sensation uh, it is that I'm having, uh, uh, along with the classifications, I classify it as, you know, sweet or hot or warm or cold uh, and so forth. But um, they both coexist because the mind has to be aware of the body. Uh, and uh, for physical experience to exist at all, you have to have consciousness or awareness of those sensations. D does that make sense? So you can't have one without the other, and they're seen as um, interdependent processes, uh, and this, this gets to this embodied cognition uh, concept that you were just talking about. Um, but there is no mind-body problem because we're not talking about absolutely opposite substances and the question of how they can interact. And there is no hard problem of consciousness because it's taken for granted that mind and body are uh, experiences that arise together, necessarily arise together, right? So let's touch on this because there's modern work looking at getting, taking matter as no longer the fundamental base block of in physics, right? Huh. So I think, Shadi, if you would like to comment a little bit on some of the theories that are arising about this notion of the experiential and the kind of information base of consciousness. Absolutely. Um, I think Fran hit the nail right on the head when she said, um, w when she characterized the, Buddh the Buddhist perspective of consciousness as being something that's you know immaterial, where um, like rejecting dualism, rejecting monoism, and so in, in uh, current circles uh, of cognitive science and philosophy of mind, there has been a rejection of uh, like this historical context in which we've been framing the problem of consciousness, which is you know, uh, going back to Descartes and then following you know, Spinoza and all, everything that came after him, um, looking at consciousness is, as, you know, is it, you know, is, is consciousness part of this platonic uh, you know, existence where we're just drawing from this unseeable um, universe where everything exists in its most pure form. Like Plato said, all is number. Uh, and then whenever you see the number one, you're just, or whenever you think of the number one or conceptualize it, you're just you know, drawing from that absolute uh, uh, perfect instantiation of the number one. That there is a separate existence to mathematics besides the one that we physically encounter every day. And that classical philosophy, the soul, is the access Mm -hmm. to the eternal verities that uh, right. that it, it fundamentally is in touch with being soul, right? Yes. So, and there are many secular legacies of that, as you're pointing out, in all of our philosophy and in our mm -hmm. language, in our everyday discourse. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, yeah, and so Descartes, you know, he said when, when, when pushed uh, to the point where of uh, trying to identify where this communication was taking place, he kind of looked at the brain and <laughs> <laughs> said, well, the p pineal gland kind of looks like yeah. it's in the middle of everything that looks squiggly and important. We don't know what it important. does, so maybe it does this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so he's like, yeah, that, that looks important. So I think that's what it is. And I think he had an evolutionary argument for it as well. Um, but um, yeah, so like back to my point and you know, back to the question which you raised, which I think is a really interesting one that we should address, um, is that currently, so um, you know, uh, John Searle actually 
brings us up in his most uh, uh, up, uh, most recent publication. And so if, you, if you're not familiar with Searle, he's, he's basically been around since the birth of cognitive science at Berkeley way back in the day. And um, you know, he's, he's seen everything, and he talks about the study of consciousness as one of the most fascinating and yet most frustrating things to be studying at the moment. Uh, not only because of like these philosophical, you know, the history of the philosophical context that we've been talking about it in, you know, putting things into monoism or reductionism or holism or dualism, he rejects that outright. And uh, there's another professor I think at Berkeley, Alvin Noe, who um, really popularized this this opinion, at least in, in circles of philosophy of mind, about um, uh, the the book is really good. You should check it out. It's called uh, Out of Our Minds, and he makes the claim uh, that. Consciousness is, you know, more so in the body than it is in the mind. And if you'll entertain me for a second, um, I'll give you some physiological, I guess, evidence for that. So, if you look at any sensory system in the in in, in, in your body, uh, whether it's somatic sensory touch or uh, vision or um, hearing, um, proprioception, uh, which is like you know the the. Well, I guess it's not really a sensation, but it's the feedback for maintaining your muscle tone and keeping an upright position. It's the feeling of your body being there. Um, all of these systems have long axon collaterals that go from you know the, the point where the sensation is being made up into the brain, and there's uh, axon collaterals that come back down through the spinal cord and synapse back at the point of where sensation is is is, is being perceived. So you have this complete loop between uh, sensation going to the brain and the brain coming back. And so it's, these loops haven't been really well mm -hmm. characterized. Um, they have a little bit in animals, um, but not in humans and how that you know, affects our, our, our like, you know, how is it that we're able to habituate to a, to a certain feeling? How is it that you know, when you're playing a soccer game and, or let's, let's say a rugby game and you fractured your rib, but you really want to beat the uglies because you know, they're jerks, right? You know, they always come to your field and tear up your turf. Um, um, you know, how, how is it that you go about completely uh, ruling out that pain? Of course, there's other things like adrenaline explaining that. But um, so back to the to the, to the to the question that was being asked, which is, uh, what is it about? Uh, how how do we address this scientifically today in 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 in, in neuroscience? So I'm gonna gloss over specifics and introduce three main ideas uh, that I think ha have been proposed by all brilliant people. Um, uh, so the first idea, I'm gonna go from highest to lowest scale. Um, so the first idea, which I think is really interesting and gets into the idea of classification, is uh, this um, hypothesis, it's not really a theory yet, worked out by this guy named Gerald Edelman. And Jared Elliman is really interesting. He actually want, he, he started off his scientific career researching immunology, and he won the Nobel Prize for uh, uh, reveal or like you know sh characterizing or explaining how the structure of antibodies, uh, uh, like w what is the structure of antibodies, and how is it that um, our immune system becomes educated over time to respond to immunological threats or threats against our body. And so he's really well known for having uh, related. Um, how our immune system evolves through time to the same way how neuronal um, uh, ensembles in the brain which come to represent different facets of experience are selected and refined and you know put into an effective machinery so he, he says you know so in the immune system you have this sort of Darwinism approach where you have creation of, t of a bunch of lymphocytes a bunch of T cells a bunch of B cells and um, these T cells are educated through trial and error and if a T cell doesn't express the right sort of cell surface receptors, that T cell is recognized by the immune system and destroyed. The same case happens in, neuros in, 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 in neurons in the brain, where you're born with way more neurons than you absolutely need. Um, but throughout the course of, of, of development from you know, birth, actually before birth, uh, prenatally, to about you know, ages uh, 11, 12, 13, and actually extending to the age 26, you're losing neurons really fast. I think you know, the percentage is something you lose anywhere between 60 and 70% of your neurons from birth to uh, you know, a, a few years after birth. And that continues on throughout adulthood. I think you're losing a neuron per second uh, right now, at this moment. <laughs> Some of us more than others. <laughs> yeah, so if you keep ba banging your head, you might be losing a little bit more than, than others. Um, so let, let, let me just, you know, Tie, tie up this point real quick. Um, so yeah, so Gerald Elliman, he, he talks about um, how 
uh, neuronal maps are formed in the brain. So he talks about like how right now we have this experience, this environment that we're trying to make sense of. And the brain has to do this really complicated task where it needs to figure out, you know, it's kind of amazing if you think about it, what is it that constitutes a unitary object? What is it that constitutes something that's moving as a whole? What is it that like, you know, uh, separates you know this animal from that animal. How does the brain go about object recognition and classification, and uh, assigning semantic meaning to things? Um, and so you see this very early on in the visual system where there are maps being made of the environment. There's you know cortical sheets in in, in V1 all the way in the back of your brain that represent things like um, uh, color and uh, orientation of of of, of bars or of, of like edges in, in the environment. Um, of uh, saliency, of things that pop out more so than others, of um, other things like complex contours. So these, the, the complexity of the representation of these maps becomes more and more complex as you move more forward in the brain. Um, and so, uh, so he has this idea of these different neural uh, maps, which over time become refined and selected for particular features. They learn in an unsupervised way, uh, lending a term from artificial intelligence, um, how to, you know, based off the statistical regularities in the environment, uh, using their own biophysical uh, uh, constraints to clump things together into meaningful units. Um, so you have these maps that are higher clear ranged and maps from the bottom that care about very simple things like contrast and color feed into things that care about things like object recognition that feed into things that care about how should behavior be realized in, in a context appropriate way? And these things are all connected through what are called reentrant loops. So for Edelman, uh, consciousness is at the level of the neuronal ensemble of you know, tens of thousands or maybe, you know, uh, I won't say hundreds of thousands, but maybe tens of thousands or thousands of neurons connected together in this way. So that's the first one. Uh, the second, I'm gonna go a lot faster because I've been talking for a bit. Um, so the second one uh, is, is proposed by Francis Crick. And, um, I don't know if you know about Crick, but he was the guy who helped Watson discover DNA, or with Watson discover DNA, um, the structure of DNA. And uh, he actually came to speak here last fall. I don't know if any of you guys saw that, but he had some interesting things to say. Um, he believes that, uh, you know, he makes a statement that consciousness is, is something that could be reducible to the molecular properties of individual neurons. So going from the neural ensemble to individual neurons and the molecules within them. And there's all sorts of evidence to, you know, to um, to back up that claim from you know, very early studies of plasticity in the brain. And then the next uh, position, which is more radical, and I think which is more in line with, uh, with fr what Fran's talking about, is uh, the level below. So what's the level below molecules and neurons? There's, what, what is it? There's nothing below that. Well, actually, there is. Um, uh, Penrose talks about quantum mechanical interactions that um, kind of going back to the dualist pr pr perspective. So there are some things that we cannot characterize about the universe. Some things that are fundamentally observable, such as uh, uh, the, the solution to the Heidenberg equation for an electron cloud. An electron exists everywhere and anywhere, you know, up until the point where you observe it. So he has worked out this theory where um, it's, it's, it's the complex, it's, um, he, he says that uh, electron delocalization in the cytoskeleton of neurons. So you have these things called alpha and beta tubulins in neurons, and you know how neurons have really squiggly shapes and they kind of look really funny, right? Well, the reason they have these shapes is because you have these dynamical uh, uh, cytoskeletal, uh, uh, you have these, the cytoskeleton in, in the cell, these tubulins are uh, being put together and broken apart very fast. And so he says this, you know, um, this annealing and uh, cat catastrophe is what it's called in biochemistry of microtubule uh, building up is actually some sort of computer. Because in, in the synapse, these microtubules are set up in such a way that all of the proteins that you need for synaptic plasticity are wired in, in, in kind of like almost like a biological circuit. It's called the postsynaptic density. So such that when you get an influx of ions that causes an action potential, all the right sequences of genes, or all the right sequences of proteins are activated so that you get the downstream gene effects to you know, consolidate the synapse or to grow out or to retract or whatever. Um, so those are the three different levels. Um, I think one of Penrose is highly criticized for this idea because there's you know he's just like saying hey you know whatever it's quantum mechanics you know it explains everything. Um, but 
scientists don't really, uh, uh, you know, they, they find it very easy to criticize him on that fact. However, um, it has been, I'm going to finish up, <laughs> it has been um, uh, more common now in neuroscience to think of cognition and the aspects of consciousness as an emergent feature, an emergent property. So there's some really exciting work going on at the University of Wisconsin-Madison uh, by Giuliano Tononi, um, who is a neuroscientist, actually he's an MD-PhD, and um, he asks the question, what is it about the brain that makes it more conscious than other material substances? So why is um, a worm more conscious than a rock? Why is um, a fish more conscious than a worm? Why is a dog more conscious than, or at least you can say, you know, you can ask these questions. Um, and so he has this, this mathematical framework called integrated information theory. So the more integrated uh, the sub subcomponents of a system are, according to this theory and in, in this mathematical formalism, the higher degree of consciousness the system can possess. And there are all sorts of ethical you know, issues that I guess we can get into in a bit uh, about this idea. Um, uh, but it, it lends to also ideas from quantum mechanics as well, measuring um, uh, electrons and distributions of electrons in, in terms of bits of information. Um, and I have some stuff to say about information as well, but those are the three, I guess, different levels or categories or uh, scales, I guess, at which people try to tackle the problem of consciousness. But I think the part that overarches most fields from you know, philosophy and theology uh, to um, physics and back to biochemistry and neuroscience is this idea of uh, information and what it means for a system to be integrated as opposed to uh, non-integrated components that are just acting in parallel, like you would see in a computer, a modern computer. And this is exactly where I wanted to go next, and then Professor Irvine, if you could, if you could take that. Because really what, what we're looking at here is we can see the complexity, the immense complexity of trying to do this. And there's a lot of popular accounts in cinema and things of machines running away and, and becoming intelligent and all these things. But if we actually start to look at what it is that makes us conscious in any type of mechanical way that could be reproduced, it's extremely complex. The amount of integration in a computer system is not nearly this nuanced as in our minds. So, Professor Irvine, I think you could begin by commenting on this, and I kind of want to open it up to everybody. Are there ways, are there potential shortcuts we could do? Are there things about sort of higher level patterns in cognition that would give us a better hope of trying to build any type of computer that has anything remotely near consciousness? Because we, we can, I think we're talking about this a little bit as, you know, consciousness is kind of a gradient, right? I think it can be kind of understood as something where an animal, you know, has a, it has a perception, you know, it maybe doesn't have symbolic cognition, but that's something even to explore. So I suppose where the question leads here is, where are we in terms of doing this? And, and what kinds of technologies might, might be left in the wake as we start to unravel this a little better and treat our computers more as integrated information systems instead of maybe just serial processors. Wow, I don't even know where to begin with that one. Um, well, one of the problems with these, these big macro questions I've always found is that we're, 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 we're dealing with terminology which, uh, which comes in at so many different levels of analysis, so many, so many descriptive levels. And often I feel like we're, we're stuck in that classic problem of equivocation, which is, using, which is using one term in multiple senses in either in the same argument or distributed over many arguments, um, where it seems like we, we might have been getting to the point where you know, consciousness is a perceived uh, mental state projected out of the kinds of things that you were just talking about, right? And maybe, maybe we could get a kind of collective consortial uh, agreement in terminology that, that let's use that as a working hypothesis. So when we use the term consciousness, we're kind of emerging out of that. But then if you're saying, well, then why, what, what level of consciousness does a worm have, for example? We're kind of then escaping out of a, of a descriptive vocabulary that seems to be usefully bounded by some things that we might be able to investigate, and then it becomes a free-for-all, you know, so, uh, in terms of computation, uh, the work that I've been really attracted to over the last few years is the work uh, that's going on kind of at that really interesting convergence of cognitive science, uh, semiotics, information theory, 
um, where where people are fundamentally focusing on, I guess you would say it's 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 at a, it's at a different level. It's it's what what do we get uh, in terms of the however human cognition has evolved out of being uh, what what Terry Deacon once called the the symbolic species. You know what what is it with that that emergence into symbolic state that has had uh, this huge ratchet effect um, for the human species in terms of everything that we've been able to do. Um, everything from language to mathematics to high order reasoning, you know, to everything we've been discussing today is a result of symbolic cognition. We're able to represent high level concepts in different kinds of terms and pattern match and categorize that and, and develop uh, different kinds of uh, you know, different kinds of abstract conceptual represent, representation for that. And with, with computation, uh, um, which, you know, I've spent some time with and, and code and, you know, doing, all, doing a lot with computers since, ever since the early 80s, actually. Um, to me, it makes sense to look at computation, algorithms, code, everything that we do, no matter how fast it is or how complex it is, this is, these are fundamentally artifacts of human symbolic cognition, right? It, it's, it's, it's just so fundamental. We, we get carried away often with when we see um, the ability to automate certain kinds of processes, the, the ability to take, uh, um, you know, sense data and process it and, and create all kinds of incredible things that we can, we can do with, uh, with machines and other kinds of interventions in the world. Uh, because of computation, uh, but uh, complexity and speed do not automatically yield intelligence, right? And this, to, to me, is one of the fundamental flaws in, like, an argument by Ray Kurzweil, for example, you know, you're probably familiar with, where, where he thinks there's something fundamental about the, the, the complexity of uh, memory, the speed of processing, and this, uh, his, you know, extrapolation of uh, fundamental, fundamentally higher orders of complexity and speed is somehow going to yield uh, a computation that is, you know, above human intelligence without, of course, stopping to define what human intelligence is to begin with, right? So what we're in that, that strange situation of, of going way out ahead, you know, as if we, we we're going to recognize artificial intelligence when we see it, you know, whether it's Turing test or something else, without ever, without really having a clear picture of, you know, what what is intelligence, you know, for which we can create artifacts, you know, that that uh, e extrapolate from that from that kind of behavior. So, for me, there's like a lot of fundamental, not only logical, but I think getting clear on what's describable, what's observable, what we can explain understanding uh, what computation, code, algorithms, information, what all, these, what all these processes are, how they relate to core human cognitive capacities, what it is about symbolic cognition that enables us to make these incredible uh, reflexive abstract kinds of extensions and leaps, right? Because that's fundamentally where it, where it comes from. You know, we can get from a species that learned how to do quantifiable language, one, two, three, four, right, to basic arithmetic, to algebra, and then E equals MC squared, right? Well, that's not random, it's not magic, it's not irrational, but there's a, there's a development of symbolic thought that has enabled us to do that, and for the incredible thing that we're able to use mathematics to represent actual real states in the world outside of symbols. Right? I mean, that is also an incredible facility. But again, this is, this is what we get out of, uh, so many of the things that we get out of um, symbolic cognition. I mean, things like recursion, things like unbounded combinatoriality. I mean, all the things that's like, you know, post Chomsky Linguistics 101, right? <laughs> uh, discrete infinity. I mean, we, we have the capability out of symbolic combinatorial processes of creating unlimited new expressions never before, you know, formed uh, according to some basic, you know, rules, uh, finite syntactic structures, finite lexicon, unlimited sets of new expressions to be formed from them, right? And that's not true only with language, that's true in mathematics, that's true in, 
um, art, that's true in music, that's true in you know any symbolic structure that you that you uh, you want to look at. I, uh, to me, I've been so excited about a convergence of people working in linguistics, semiotics, philosophy of mind, philosophy of language, cognitive science, people doing both the kind of trying to figure out neurologically, you know, how does this, you know, how, what's going on neurologically when we start looking at symbolic behavior and the, the neuroscience stuff that, that I can understand because it's not my background, every time I look at it, like, um, you know this guy, uh, Dehaene, the French Yeah, French Stanley guy? Dehaene, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, when you read his stuff, like he's talking about plasticity and all that stuff, mm -hmm. it's like when you start looking at somebody doing, you know, kind of symbolic cognitive behavior, mm -hmm. there's so many areas in the brain that light up, right? There's, it's not localized, yeah. like in one place, right? So I guess my point is, is that there's so much that we really don't know yet, but this frontier, I think, of, of human symbolic behavior and how it does connect our ability to, to do things like computation, to build high, models of high orders of abstraction that we can create simulations for, you know, like computable simulations for. To me, this is a continuum of, you know, core human symbolic cognitive processes. Not, not, they're not products of machines, right? They're not, you know what I mean? They're not like autonomous things that are anti-human or unhuman. These are extensions of core human abilities. So to me, there's like, this, this frontier is so exciting and so much new research and probably 10 different disciplines, you know, on that. And to me, that's like a hard enough question. And, you know, whether or not at some other level it really is a quantum computer that's, you know, driving it, <laughs> well, maybe someday we'll find out. <laughs> but we're a little, you know, we're closer, I think, on the symbolic, you know, and, and linguistic side. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what, if that's your sense, too. But. Um, yeah, I mean, I have a few things to say if you didn't, if you wanted to chime in for Yeah, I'm sorry, um, we, we need to open it further. Um, well, Give us, give us briefly comment, and then I do want to bring it around because there's something I've been noticing and wanting to engage with with you all about. So, so go ahead and, and respond um, quickly. Yeah, you. sure. I'll respond as, as quick as I can. I have to condense <laughs> my thoughts. Yeah, yeah um, you're, you're dealing with professors, and you want us to be quick. You know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, not yet. I'm not yet. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. So you brought up, uh, Dr. Irvine. You brought up the the idea of, of recursion. And recursion is actually really interesting if, if you think about it. So what is recursion? If, in case, you know, if nobody's ever taking uh, computational neuroscience, or computational, computation, or not computation, computer science course or linguistics course. Uh, recursion is basically recursion. <laughs> what is recursion? Oh, it's recursion. It's processing of processing. So rec recursion is, you know, um, you have, the, I guess the easiest way I can think to define it would be in a mathematical term, which is, you have some function, and at, func uh, at uh, t equals zero, you have some initial conditions. And then at t equals uh, pl uh, t plus one, you plug in what you had in the previous position into the next equation. So actually, this becomes a really useful way for solving differential equations in mathematics, uh, where you uh, have um, some initial conditions, you solve the ODE, uh, the ordinary differential equation, you get an expression in, ter in a, a dx dt, you get an expression in terms of time, and you keep updating that equation over and over and over again. So this method of solving uh, ordinary differential equations came out in the 60s. Um, and what one really talented mathematician, he was actually a meteorologist named Edward Lorentz, uh, found was that you can actually create some really interesting um, uh, you can model some, some, sim some, sim some systems in some really interesting ways, such as weather. Uh, and so that's what he did. He c created these ODEs that, was a that were able to characterize how like, a small gust of wind or how a small perturbation in the pressure within you know, a, a certain part of the country would affect uh, the weather in, 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 in Shanghai or Hong Kong. So the butterfly effect. Uh, the flap of a butterfly's wings in, in Chicago can cause a hurricane and you know, God knows where. But, um, so the, the idea of recursion uh, kind of leads right into dynamical systems theory. Dynamical systems theory is um, this idea that came out of what was called chaos theory, or the research of cha uh, chaos and complexity in the 60s and 70s, and is now, I think, um, a really interesting and exciting and captivating and holds a lot of promise in, in cognitive neuroscience and computational neuroscience. Um, so people have been using uh, dynamical systems models to model individual neurons. Uh, so, uh, 
can we solve the voltage, the evolution of voltage over time for an individual neuron? If we can do that, which we can, can we link these things up together in a network and then understand or visualize how population activity, so getting back at those different levels, is it at the ensemble, is it at the single neuron level, or is it some, somewhere below consciousness or com complex cognitive processing? Um, so then, you know, wiring up these neurons with these, uh, with these different ODEs and then making these large scale models of neurons given some, you know, uh, initial conditions. So there's one really interesting rule that's been used uh, in, in these models, and that's called spike timing dependent plasticity. Um, and so what spike timing dependent plasticity is, is that if you have one neuron, say you have, you know, two neurons that are actually connected together, and one of them cares about the detection of light and another one cares about um, the detection of um, something scary in the light, right, uh, once the light comes on. So if these two neurons fire together in, in a very close time window, such that if a neuron A fires and it's some delta T that's small enough, uh, you know, considering the biophysical constraints of the neuron, if that other neuron fires just close enough in time after the first neuron fires, their connection becomes strengthened. So what people have done is create artificial retinas using this rule to track objects. So there's one really interesting example of a camera that was placed on uh, a highway, uh, in, and I think in somewhere in LA, and uh, a bunch of French uh, computational neuroscientists were tasked with the problem of counting all of the cars that w would drive down the lanes throughout, you know, throughout the day uh, on this highway. And so that's actually a really hard problem for even an individual person to do. Not only do you have to identify a car from non-cars, but you also have to be able to track the car as it's moving. So they took, uh, and the reason I'm explaining this, I guess I'll get into this, but, um, so they took the basic ideas of what we know about vision in the brain and the biophysical constraints of neurons that process vision, and they applied it into an artificial neural network, a neural network in silico. And what they were able to do was count cars, you know, using this very simple spike timing dependent plasticity algorithm uh, rule for, for an algorithm. They were able to, uh, they just let the neuron go. They didn't do anything but set the initial parameters in the structure of the network. And the, it only had like 20 parameters, a very small scale network. And this network was actually able to learn <laughs> how to characterize lanes and how to identify cars coming down lanes. So this is really exciting. Well, what so, was specified as the goal in the algorithm? Had to be some there was no a prior. So this is a. There was like no a. They didn't tell the neuron to look for cars, or they didn't tell the network to look for cars or to look for things. They so they also used the same network to model w walking down a hallway, and they found neurons that would you know through this this algorithm start detecting things such as like the intersection between the ceiling and 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 and, and the sides of the wall. That, so using this algorithm, you can. What they found is that individual neurons in the network start caring about fundamental statistical regularities that appear in the environment. Um, okay, I get it. Right. So this is pre-semantic. This is pre-categorical, pre pre basically. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, so this is very low, much lower in, in the hierarchy. Um, and there is some stuff that does, that, that do semantics. Um, well, I, I want to I jump right off of this one, because yeah. this has huge economic implications. Absolutely. There yeah. are people working furiously to make these types of systems that will be able to identify what things are. Well, right video. up to Google's, you know, auto drive car. You know, well, exactly. You know, and so I, I, I want to I wanna bring us around here, though, to start. When we study these systems, and we then begin to build versions of them, even in small components, there's something interesting afoot ethically, I think. Even morally, we could go into, where you're using the architecture of our minds to then build technologies we will employ as tools. So the question starts to arise of, are we going to have to start paying more attention to these systems and treating them differently if we notice certain things about them? And this is where I really want to engage you, Dr. Chovis, is on the ethical considerations of this. Because these aren't mere this isn't a mere algorithm anymore. This is this is a learning system. It's a very it learned a very simple thing, but that's a learning system. So you start plugging in modular components of other learning systems, you might have something interesting. Even though we, we just discussed how complex it would be to build something like this, still we find ourselves looking over the edge of something entirely different from the kinds of tools we've ever built before. So I would be curious if you 
even in this work already, if you're seeing any ethical concerns arise with, with what we have built. Well, um, are you talking about concerns about actually building conscious machines and uh, the question of then how do we treat these entities? I mean, without already defining what consciousness is? Right. Well, I mean, that's, I suppose, part of the, the problem um, in that I don't think, uh, and you mentioned this, we've solved the problem of how to define consciousness in human beings. We have? Right? We have not. Oh, yeah. We okay. have not. So I thought maybe you had a Buddhist insight that I should should learn. Right? Well, I do have a Buddhist insight, but <laughs> it, it's not. Um, but uh, that's the next step. Okay. Uh, my no matter, never mind. Right? Is that uh, no matter? <laughs> or is it? No, no matter. No. No. Never mind. Oh. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, Bedroom. No, my <laughs> point was, <laughs> in biomedical ethics, we have a hard time dealing with the question or answering the question, when is um, a certain entity now conscious or when has it lost consciousness, right? We can talk about brain states, but we can't um, determine whether uh, this person is conscious or not. And we can talk about stages of embryonic and fetal development but we can't really pinpoint the, the, uh, a moment that you know, this becomes conscious. And I think the word or the concept of consciousness is ethically very important because when we say something is conscious, that means we have moral obligations about how to treat that entity. So if a person in a persistent vegetative state is deemed conscious, then there are certain legal and moral things that we may or may not do. So um, I think the same situation uh, potentially, I suppose, applies <laughs> um, to machines. But my Buddhist insight is that, uh, remember, from this religious perspective, consciousness is first and foremost our experiences um, of the world, um, a way in which we um, exist. And so um, in the uh, hypothetical situation of attributing consciousness to uh, something that has, you know, a plastic metal <laughs> wire basis, um, I, I think the important question uh, is, do I experience that entity as a conscious uh, living entity? Uh, regardless of, you know, its, its physical substrates. It seems to me that's, um, you so know, words, what's more, most right. fundamentally what important. I, what I like about that approach, I mean, and again, it's not, these are fundamental questions. It's not something you can agree or disagree with, per se. But what you're doing is like, you're, you're making it impossible to speculate about essences, you know, either right. on the human side right. or on the artifact side, right. something created, because it, it basically says, well, that's that's a pseudo question, or it's like it's a non question. Exactly. We, we can we can create language and articulate statements like that, right? Mm -hmm. But the quite then the fundamental problem is, but they don't they don't get us anywhere. I guess you would say yeah. from this. I think right. I, th I think it's really interesting though that you're bringing up you know okay so say we do have this great technological um, renaissance where you know all of a sudden we're able to build these systems that can do all sorts of things such as you know you just you know in the morning your phone turns on and on, on its own accord and tells you everything about your day and reminds you to do everything that you need to do to you know to put your pants on make sure you don't leave without your pants right uh, to brush your well, teeth. That's what spouses look for. <laughs> well, for us unmarried folk, um, <laughs> but. Um, as a service. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that gets rid of marriage, actually. You know, I'm looking forward to the future. Um, but, um... Boyfriend, girlfriend, partner. You can outsource those functions. <laughs> oh, gosh. Um. <laughs> no, but in a very real sense, that we're, that's what we're talking about in terms of yeah. computational and software processes. Well, I mean, this whole idea of cognitive offloading. You know, we're, we're able to cognitively offload all kinds of processes. I mean, that's one of the reasons that, you know, computation and, and, and mobile phones and, you know, all of our, all of our computational devices are, uh, 
correspond so well to, to human needs is that we can offload an awful lot of stuff. Absolutely, we're on the precipice. Um, and, and the point that I was going to bring up was just so you know, uh, Fran talked about how uh, Dr. Cho talked about how um, you know if we do have these systems that come into our society, we're probably going to need metrics to know what is con like what is conscious on a scale. Of, of you know, is, is there a scale which we can measure consciousness of? And you know, one of the very first early things that um, Dr. Irvine brought up uh, was the Turing test. So I don't know if you all are familiar with the Turing test, but basically it's um, this test that you perform. Like I don't know if you've seen the movie Blade Runner, uh, where you are uh, there's like two people that are behind a booth. One of them is not a person, but really an artificial intelligence. The other person is a person. And there's an interrogator. And the interrogator has to ask questions to both of them and tries to ask questions in such a way that he could figure out what is really just an artificial intelligence and what is a computer. Um, so that gets at some questions. Uh, that, that has some issues with it as well. Um, yeah, so being, for able to being able to fool a human interrogator doesn't seem to be like a really useful definition of intelligence. Mm. Exactly, and also there's you know Searle, this guy that I was talking about earlier, who was there at the beginning of cognitive science. He has this thing called the Chinese room argument against this, which is you know you could imagine uh, yourself put into a room where you have this big dictionary, and whenever you s and, and you're sitting in this room completely closed off from the environment, and somebody puts in a piece of paper through a slot, and your ta your task is to take that piece of paper, and so imagine you know you're the one being interrogated to take that piece of paper. And it's in Chinese, right? And so you don't understand Chinese. What you do is you look it up in this big, you know, tome that you have, and you follow up all the all the all the uh, cross references between English and the Chinese symbols. You transcribe it, and then you pass it through uh, the through the through the slot. Does that mean that you know Chinese or are conscious or aware of all the subtleties and intricacies of the Chinese language? No, it doesn't. Do you know how to take a set of symbols? You have a lookup table, right? That maps onto another set of symbols. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think what's a more interesting metric uh, is, is let's bring up the idea of information theory again. So you may have heard of information theory before, but it was inve invented by who's considered the grandfather of the information age, uh, Claude Shannon. And so basically this guy, in his master's thesis, opened up, um, uh, opened up this, this, this field of, of, of telecommunications uh, defining this idea of a bit and basically Closed this opened and closed this field in a master's thesis. Absolutely amazing at a really young age. Um, I admire him. But uh, Julia, <laughs> <laughs> my master's the thesis is nowhere as cool. Terminology, we would, we'd, we'd be a lot better. Um, talking about the mathematical theory of communication. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So and just how that spawned all this we other had a class stuff. We class in this today, my students. So they're, uh, they're laughing. They're just like I was wondering. I thought oh, I had no, something in my face. Again. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but you know, just so Claude Shannon informed a lot of things, and one of the ideas was this integrated information theory approach. And so, with this integrated information theory approach, what you can do is uh, Tononi defines this thing called phi, which is you know a circle with like an eye through it, I guess. Um, and this phi is supposed to be a metric of how conscious something is. It measures the mutual information of all the subcomponents, and basically makes uh, you know explaining very generally. Uh, how much are, is the whole greater than the sum of the parts? And so what you can do with this is you can measure uh, the information content of different networks in the brain, like when they turn on, when they turn off during resting states, and how they co-vary with each other, and how and you can compute mutual information from that. And that's actually an exciting field of neuroscience research today. And you can do things like image the fetus. So abortion. When is it OK to abort a baby? Is it OK to abort a baby that's conscious and alive? It doesn't seem OK. but what you could do with things like this is measure the information, integrated information. You'd have a metric to say this baby is more conscious than um, a collection of organic molecules, uh, but not as conscious as, uh, like a, as, as a human would be at a certain stage in a trimester. Um, so I think, I think the, the tools that we, we could use for this are, uh, are out there. I mean, we shouldn't focus on only one, we should continue to work on developing others to confirm, uh, because we don't want to run the risk of, I think a false negative is probably worse than a false positive in this case, where you know you say a fetus isn't conscious, but it actually is. Or a per per person in a persistent vegetative state is conscious, but you say he isn't. Um, 
So I think that you know we should work on alternative metrics for measuring consciousness, consciousness as well. Um, I think we need yeah. a more, ro more robust vocabulary too, because the problem, one of the problems I have with all of this is that you know defining you know metrics for states of consciousness gets well not only is that problematic but um, I mean we know even even as much as I know about neuroscience which isn't a lot I just try to learn from what you guys you know the conclusions you guys <laughs> you guys give which they're is, mostly wrong <laughs> <laughs> well there's a lot of work to do um, which is that we fundamentally know from e e higher order reasoning you know language other kinds of symbolic behavior that whatever we call meaning, you know, whatever we call these these processes of, of generating meaning, creating reading, interpreting meaning, perceiving reading, meaning, not only are these fundamentally unobservable, but they're also unconscious, right? Mm -hmm. Unconscious, I, however you want to define the term unconscious, mm -hmm. right? We are not aware of how we right. create meaning. We are not aware of how we create syntactically well-formed sentences in our native language. We are not, right? So. But it's kind of a given that that's part of what makes someone conscious, you know, human, right? Is the ability to do that. But we can't observe it, right? We, 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 we can't catch ourselves in the act of doing it, right? So it, it, we just need a different, I think we need a more robust, finely tuned vocabulary, right? If, if all of these things that are core to human consciousness, like these higher order cognitive tasks, are fundamentally unconscious, mm -hmm. right? Um, what, where do we go with that? Well, I'd like to bring in a, a different angle to this. Um, and that's to raise the question of whether or not it's ethical to create consciousness. Not, not. Uh, I mean, partly in the sense of, you know, are we playing God? That, that would be an obvious question. But, um, uh, more from the perspective of, is it compassionate <laughs> to generate consciousness? Um, we've been talking about how uh, human uh, cognitive processes are so complex, uh, and you know it's difficult to try to replicate that um, artificially. Um, our capacity for symbolic thinking, our um, uh, and many of the other. Um, you know, uh, functions that, that you were mentioning um, are the very same things that create pain and suffering, <laughs> at least in, again, the Buddhist analysis. So if you know anything about Buddhism, you know the basic teaching is uh, the Four Noble Truths. And the first truth is that all existence is suffering. And perhaps that's more um, um, accurately uh, translated is all conscious experience or existence is suffering. Okay, so um, what we celebrate as the result of complexity, you know, the capacity to uh, process information and engage in symbolic thought uh, are the very same things uh, that create the problems, uh, most particularly uh, the illusion that our own cognitive um, outputs, our structures, our, our classifications um, are really what is existing out there. We mistake our own mental functions uh, uh, to be objective reality in and of itself, and that is what ultimately leads us into trouble. So on the one hand, yeah, it, it's great that you know we're at the brink of um, doing so much more in terms of our scientific um, and technological uh, capacities. But from a different perspective, you might say, oh, well, it's not necessarily a given that that's a good thing to do. Maybe at a certain level, um, creating robots uh, to which we can outsource Suffering. Domestic, domestic, um, you know, chores Spouses. like <laughs> vacuuming and yeah, as as um, we were talking about before, yeah, perhaps to uh, uh, that that's obviously a convenience for us. But why is it that we would want to push? Is it just for the sake of knowledge? Just for the sake of um, you know, just uh, uh, evolving that capacity? Uh, in and of ourselves, and of course, you know, now we get into all the science fiction scenarios about, you know, cloning and genetic um, uh, engineering uh, and so forth. 
Uh, but just in terms of the experience of consciousness per se, uh, I suppose partly it's because we think it's phenomenal, and, and it is. It's an amazing thing, this, this capacity. Mm -hmm. um, but the reason why I think those Buddhist monks are so interested in cognitive science and finding out scientifically about how the brain works is so that they can figure out also how better to sort of reverse engineer what the con conscious mind normally tends to do, which is to create these sort of mm -hmm. illusory perceptions of, of the world around us, including most primarily the concept, the perception of the self. And I was really interested when you were talking about these neural processes uh, that function to carve out, you know, certain uh, volumes of stuff and mm -hmm. put a label on it. And in, in uh, the religious analysis, that's what we do with the concept of the self. The self is not ultimately separate uh, from um, the extended environment and the larger community. Uh, yeah, it, it, we're all continuous, but because our minds and our cognitive processes make that distinction, that is the primary source of dissatisfaction and unhappiness. And so why would we want to, you know, like, uh, deliberately create <laughs> that capacity, you know, in... To make in, things... Uh, yeah. To make things even weirder, um, <laughs> um, so Alan Turing showed that you know you can have this thing called the universal Turing machine, which is this computer that can compute any 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 you know effectively computable pr problem. Um, Oops, I'm sorry. That's, oh it's, my goodness. Got upset when it's, that, it's, it's suffering. Yeah. Okay. Uh, All right. Sorry. Um, yeah. So. <laughs> So what Alan Turing uh, sort of, um, you know, may, uh, uh, proposed was that there are multiple solutions to many algorithms. You can have a really simple Turing machine. You can have a really complex Turing machine. So there may be many solutions to the problem of consciousness. You know, maybe you don't need biological hardware to be conscious. And you know, if you go back again to information theory, which I think is a really interesting uh, uh, conceptual device that allows, you know, enables us in many fields of science. Um, there's you know, been all sorts of interesting work with it, using information theory on the language of dolphins to see what is the relationship between, um, or how, how complex is dolphin language to human language to more simple types of monkey uh, languages, which are just you know, hoots and hollers uh, that, are, you know, that aren't hierarchically structured. Um, another really interesting concept, again borrowing from the language of dynamical systems theory, is scale invariance. That, um, uh, so, for example, all mammals, on average, have the same number of heartbeats. So, you know, a shrew, an elephant, a giant, you know, a big whale, we all have the same number of heartbeats. You mean over a lifetime? Or? Over a lifetime, yeah. On average. So what you can do is you can fit a power law function uh, to, uh, if you look at metabolic rate, which is a proxy for heart rate, and longevity of, of life. And so what this says is that there is this underlying law or principle about the way that our bodies and cardiovascular systems are structured um, that, um, you know, depending on how big you are, the amount of mass that you possess informs uh, your metabolic rate, which informs longevity of your life. And you can fit all sorts of other things with this power law function as well, such as a degree of cerebellar dendritic branching, or like how branched are the neurons in your cerebellum, or uh, the density of white matter in certain parts of the brain. Um, so this idea that uh, there are these rules that apply at multiple scales, and what's there to you know what's there to say that we stop at the biggest mammal? What if we keep going to larger things, such as um, and you know I'm just speculating here. You know this isn't really grounded. There are physicists working on this, but um, what's what's to stop solar systems or galaxies or systems of galaxies? Because the universe is pretty freaking large, man. Like, <laughs> if you think about it, the amount of scale is insane. <laughs> um, yeah, I was going to say something more explicit, but I decided not to. Um, yeah, so, like, you know, getting back at this idea of, uh, you know, us being, you know, connected to our environment in a much more fundamental way than, than, than we think, you know, there might be life and consciousness all around us. And again, just speculation, there's no scientific grounding to this. Um, there might be life and consciousness all around us that we're just not perceiving or not aware of at the moment. Um, if you look at the way that galaxies over very long periods of time 
you know, hundreds of billions of human lifetimes would have elapsed by the time they're done their beautiful dances with each other. For example, Andromeda and the Milky Way, they're supposed to, you know, collide and, you know, there's these beautiful simulations of them almost looking like amoebas that are kind of like absorbing bits and pieces of each other and settling into mm. another, uh, you know, uh, uh, settling into a more stable state, a larger galaxy with, all, you know, different sorts of complexity. Um, and this is what you see also in, 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 in human life, right? Um, the mitochondria in our cells, you know, the powerhouses of, 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 of everything that makes us alive, or it's the powerhouse of life, these came from a symbiotic relationship where there was an amoeba that was just floating out there and, you know, in the ocean way back in the day, and then found this other amoeba. It was like, hey, dude, I'm going to eat you up, and then tries to eat him up. And then the, you know, the, the amoeba goes in and is like, hey, I kind of like it in here. I'm going to start making ATP. And then it starts making energy. <laughs> and then, then you, there you have it. You have like a system for life. So I think that you know, we should be as open-minded as possible about what is conscious and what isn't consciousness. It's these kinds of things that make me feel really uh, bad about smashing a bug, for example, or for um, you know, uh, throwing things off. Because you know, I think that the properties of life or that the mysteries or beautiful things about life are all around us in ways that we can't even perceive. And again, this is taking us away from the scientific focus of the talk or of the, of the discussion, but I think that also plays but into you're, it. But you're not, and this is a great space for us to end. It's been an amazing talk, but this is where we are, right? Where we have to be aware and open-minded in our own sense and also take responsibility, even in anything that you create, right? Even other life. That's a big responsibility. Consciousness, there's a lot of weight in being conscious. And so there seems to be some element of, it's almost, sometimes seems like it's imbued in the universe in a sense. And so this leads us, I wanna leave us with this kind of question of where does this take us next in our perspective as we try to build systems using this emergent sort of knowledge, this perspective we're going to have to be very aware of what we are doing and take full responsibility for our actions. So this is where we seem to be touching on, right? This is, we've concluded here because finally we've found a point and I want to open this up <laughs> to you guys. We've wrapped it up. Because this is something we could go on and on and on, but I, I want to, I want to open this up now to you guys. And so who, who is the question? Ben, you what do you uh, so there's been a lot of wonderful, excellent, very complex things that have been said tonight, and they mostly went over my head. Um, would it be possible as panelists to agree on a one sentence definition of what is consciousness or what is being debated at that? Because I feel like we rushed into it, and uh, I need to kind of start from ground zero here. So. John, can you repeat the question, please? Sure. So Ben Lee is, is tasking the panelists with trying to get at a one sentence <laughs> definition of consciousness, uh, which is a tall order to do. Something working, right? We don't need to close it, but just something to give us our, our base point of where we are now in our understanding. That which thinks that is, taking Descartes' definition and sort of putting it in a third person singular form, I guess. <laughs> that which thinks is, well, if you take cogito, I think all you've proven is that there is something that can articulate the expression, I think. You haven't, I mean, right? You, yeah, it's a linguistic sort of. You, you, haven't proven, you haven't proven anything that's extensible, right? From, from being able to use in whatever language you have, uh, I think, right? Um, nothing necessarily follows. Some, some cognitive agent in a natural language is able to use the first person pronoun to designate a speaking subject, right? Followed by the verb think, right? Well, we were talking about AI too. It's perfectly, I mean, it's very easy to create a software agent that can articulate back, I think, right? I mean, if that's all we're looking for, right? So, um, is, uh, I don't know, are we getting really reductive here? Consciousness is uh, whatever agency articulates expressions such as these? I mean, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, like, with the point that I was trying to bring up before is, you know, consciousness is this wonderful mystery that, you know, we're probably never going to, you know, be able to categorize and catalog in our, 
you know, wonderful scientific ways, all of the things that can be conscious or the things that are conscious. Um, I think uh, a fail-safe go-to method is to, you know, treat all things that possess complex behavior with the same amount of respect that you would uh, that you would exhibit towards your common fellow man. Um, so this includes bugs, and this includes uh, robots and androids that are built for the same purpose of. Um, you know, bringing your dinner to you at night and wishing you good night before you go to sleep. Um, you were supposed to give a one sentence answer. One sentence. <laughs> <laughs> but it's fascinating, right? It's fascinating. So, Dr. Show, give us your. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, consciousness uh, is the quality of sentience. Sentience, um, yeah. sentience right. Uh, which is obviously possessed by human beings, but animals as well um, that has the quality of awareness, awareness of its own experiences of what's going on in uh, the mind as, as well as um, physical sensory uh, experiences as well. Okay, I'll deconstruct an old cliche. There's a, an early AI cog sci guy, Rodney Brooks, who coined the phrase that Conscious is, is really just a cheap trick of nature, you know, in the sense that uh, some mechanism evol evolved to be able to organize a whole bunch of uh, parallel, and like you were talking about, these multi-tiered, multi-layered, you know, neurological processes, to organize them so that the organism had some coherent way of acting and sensing and behaving in the world, right? Um, I'm, I'm just saying that that, you know, you could be reductive and snarky and say that, well, yeah, maybe consciousness really is just a cheap trick that evolved to, to organize uh, neurologically and to, to organize, you know, the states that you were saying. But um, I, I think fundamentally we don't have uh, a, a good enough vocabulary and a, fi and a fine mm. enough way to describe what we're trying to get at, unfortunately. Uh, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't stop working but that uh, conscience does seem to sum up whatever it is we believe it is when uh, we are experiencing the world. And to me, what the, the thing that we left out, and very quickly, is that to me, it doesn't make any sense to talk about consciousness that isn't fundamentally and primarily intersubjective, right? We've been mm -hmm. talking a lot about you know, self and you know, single brain identity. But the thing that makes the human species different from other species is this fundamental, collective, social, intersubjective consciousness, which defines us more than any other species. And to me, it's the foundation of anything ethical. If I could revise my multi-sentence to a one sentence, um, <laughs> um, to give it a more general, I guess, mathematical uh, definition, I would say that consciousness is uh, a transient stable point or attractor, taking it from the language of dynamical systems, uh, a transient attractor of multiple systems uh, mediating complex, complex input and output or behavior. And we do it collectively? Um, yeah, so you can have many attractors in parallel, all interacting with each other, or the input from one feeds into the output of one feeds into the input of the other. Okay. That's <laughs> I, that's useful, though. It's, we have to, the vocabulary is not yeah, quite I sufficient, mean, so we have to we, figure out ways of discussing it. So I, we have time for one more question from the audience. Linda. Linda. Um, hi. <laughs> so I'm going to give myself up as a student of Ryan's right now. Um, so also talking to John, I know you're really into the idea of reproducing or duplicating existing human consciousness, which is like, in many ways, you know, I, I think it's similar to the, uh, you, the way you said at the beginning, like something I feel like tabling right now, because it's like we're not even like close, <laughs> to be honest. Um, but what I think is kind of already happening um, in a much more like imminent sci-fi kind of way is the evolution of the consciousness we already have, uh, paired with you know, be it uh, you know your spouse even is an impetus for evolution, and you know to be to reference her for the second Nova's panel here. Um, you know, co-evolution with increasingly smart technologies, even if they're not conscious per se. Um, I mean, what, how do we even do this, <laughs> talk about consciousness, and what we're talking about is moving underneath our own feet? Um, also, I guess maybe my question here is, do you, do you see this in your work, in the work that you're doing? Do you see 
our own consciousness is something that's moving and changing all the time, or is it still just waking up in the morning and smelling the coffee? Is what it is and always will be. Yeah, one thing I had in my mind that I wanted to talk about, but I, I couldn't fit it into what I wanted to say, was um, how when I gave my first definition of consciousness as, you know, that's something really simple, it's the quality of consciousness, we also have to remember that consciousness or states of mind can exist on a spectrum, right? So, you know, you can have your normal waking conscious experience where you're walking down the hallway and you're saying hi to all your classmates and you're ready to go to class and have a great semester. You can also have the state of consciousness where you're kind of uh, uh, sleepy and really grumpy and don't want to talk to anybody. You could have the state of consciousness where you're completely passed out because you've been drinking all night. You could have the state of consciousness where maybe you ate some magic mushrooms and you are having a psychedelic experience. So the spectrum of conscious experiences can, or of, of uh, uh, types of mind states could be, um, you know, consciousness isn't something to be cataloged and binned into discrete categories. Uh, it's something that's shifting, that's dynamic with time. And, you know, the pro property of a transient attractor, what it is, is something that, you know, uh, that puts, that, you know, sucks in all of the free parameters of the system into one regime of stability for a short amount of time. And that regime of stability can shift to the left, to the right, or in whatever dimensions that system is operating in, and then dissipate, and then come back again in a different, uh, uh, in a different subregion of that state space. Well, I would just add that, um, going back to um, Martin's point, that the shifting, evolving nature of consciousness, I think, is directly um, a result of changing social context. So it's, it's never the, the mind or the brain on its own, but it's this uh, collective kind of interdependent process in which evolution of new technologies creates new, you know, capacities uh, of the mind, which is simply um, observable in the fact that my own kids, you know, growing up in a environment that's so different from me are capable of doing things that, that I can't, you know. I mean, they, they seem to understand being on computers and doing things with them, which is uh, so difficult for, for me to parse. So uh, I think it's important to keep in mind that, you know, it's, it's never <laughs> uh, an isolated entity, but always a, a collective process. We're having a second or third round of one sentence definitions. No, no, we're, we're responding to uh, Linda's questions. Um, so about the different states of consciousness and whether it's appropriate to define consciousness as something that's stable. It's evolution with technology, right? So is, as Linda said, is consciousness, the very the act of trying to define it, is that shifting beneath our feet as we, as we look out to try and define it? Are we always going to be chasing it? Too, as we develop these technologies. Well, yeah, I mean, as I think we've we've all agreed that there are uh, that we that we can define so many levels of consciousness and then uh, projections of consciousness into humanly made artifacts of various kinds. Um, that again, I, I I think we don't have a descriptive vocabulary that's common enough among a lot of dif disciplines. You know that we can that we can work with yet. But what we're seeing, I think this, this wonderful interdisciplinary dialogue helps us see that there are some fundamental questions that almost every field is asking right now, right? And we're all trying to get at it from the resources of, of the various intellectual scientific resources mm -hmm. right, that we're working at. Um, and I wish there were more moments where there could be more of a collective, uh, collective effort to to find vocabularies that kind of, you know, <laughs> resolve and so we're, we're never going to have, you know, grand harmonic convergence and, you know, <laughs> sorting out agreements about all of our fundamental vocabularies, but it, it seems like there's got to be some progress, you know, that can be made. Um, and and I, we're, we're not really close, but we still have to keep pushing and, and comparing the results of, of research and knowledge that, that we're producing. And, I mean, we, there has been incredible progress, I think, the last 20 years, you know. And, um, but we're nowhere close to being able to describe, you know, all of the tiers and layers of that. Right? Uh, 
I don't think. Yeah, so for me, I, we, we still have to keep working at it, but for me, there's some fundamental problems at levels above you know, what consciousness is that, that I find much more productive and much more interesting and fruitful, um, especially you know, what symbolic cognition gives us and why human societies are so fundamentally uh, intersubjective and social. There's a whole theory of the social evolution of, of the mind, you know, from uh, human social behavior. And those are things that we can observe and, and track a little bit more clearly than so many of the other um, fundamental kind of hard science questions, you know, that, that, are, hmm. that are so fundamental to keep exploring, you know, but the results aren't in yet. Yeah. I mean, neurologically, you have things like mirror neurons and uh, psychological phenomena such as syntactic priming or semantic priming. So, for example, if you move to another part of the country and you live there long enough, the syntactic structure that that you know group of people uses, like their dialect, will eventually become embedded in the syntactic structure that you use if you're not explicitly you know uh, trying to suppress that. So, you mm -hmm. know how. Um, like, you know, I, I spoke a little bit about how statistical regularities in the environment are parsed by, you know, these biophysical things that we have going on in our brain, like spike timing dependent plasticity. Um, you know, these statistical regularities become uh, embedded into our own consciousness much more than I think we appreciate. Um, how there are primes all, you know, dispersed all throughout our, our environment and they're actively informing the sort of behavior and the sort of um, actions that, that, that we pursue. And I want to close us out here with this open horizon. We have very different perspectives and levels of the approach. And so we get to see it's going to take a lot of work and a lot of people and a lot of perspectives to even try and deal with this in any meaningful way. So we have a big horizon here in front of us. But it is, it's an exciting time to explore this because we have these specific instances, we have frameworks, and we have the guidance of the broad view. So I think there's going to be a lot of interesting things to keep following in this. And I hope that everyone here, even if there were specific things that you, you didn't find, you understood, or, or anything like that, it's really, this is, an, this is a collaborative effort. Everyone has a unique perspective. I was sitting here and quite, quite, blown away, right? Because no one mind can unravel the mind. There's no way that that's going to happen. It's going to take all of us. And thank you so much, panelists, for guiding us through this discussion. <laughs>